Hello, everybody. I see a bunch of people signing on. We're going to get started in just a minute. Welcome. Get settled in. All right, looks like we've leveled out. Everybody seems to be signed on, so we're going to get this on the road. And hello, everybody. This is Lars Light from the Psalm Journal, welcoming you on behalf of the Psalm Journal, the Psalm Foundation, and the New Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia by National Geographic Publishing. Welcome to our latest in the winery close-ups educational series, Iconic Grapes and Distinctive Regions. Uh, this is actually our last of the year, but we'll be back in January. Uh, so we're living right now in a, I would almost call it a golden age of winemaking. Uh, good wine can be made anywhere in the world, but there are certain grapes, certain areas that are indelibly linked to each other and make wines that have a distinctly unique and inimitable sense of place. Those are the wines that I consider to be worthy of the carbon footprint, worthy of shipping around the world for their unrivaled excellence. And as I said before, sense of place. And we're going to take a look at some of those, some great examples of those today. So this is being recorded. Uh, we're on Facebook Live on the Psalm Journal platform, and the recording will be linked from both psalmjournal.com and psalmfoundation.com. A printed recap of this webinar will appear in the February-March issue of the Psalm Journal. And uh, besides all that, there are a lot of more, even better reasons for you to keep tuned in. Uh, and we have Lynn Fletcher from the Psalm Foundation to tell us about some of the incentives that'll, that'll make sure you're paying attention and, uh, and enjoying the, the webinar. So welcome, Lynn. Thank you, Lars. So first of all, I, I want to just say thank you to all of our panelists and Lars and the Psalm Journal for making these scholarships possible. Uh, so tomorrow we'll be doing a random drawing and eight of uh, you on the, the session today will receive one year's access to the Psalm Geo program. Uh, and also we have a, a scholarship contest. So uh, within two days, everybody on the session will receive an email prompt with an essay question about what was discussed on this session. And you'll have until December 22nd to submit your essay of 500 words or less. And the top two winners will receive a copy of the New Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia and first place will receive a scholarship check for $400. Uh, so uh, pay attention today um, and we'll be sending that prompt out again uh, via email within the next two days. And uh, we look forward to seeing your responses. And Lars, back to you. Thanks, Lynn. Those are pretty good incentives and pretty good rewards for those of you who are uh, paying attention and uh, expressing and continuing this as part of your education, which Psalm Foundation is just wonderful about that. Thank you, Lynn, for all the great resources you give to the Psalm community. Uh, another great resource is Psalm Geo. Uh, I always like to call it Google Maps meets wine country. I don't know if Greg Wagner is getting sick of hearing that or not, but Greg, uh, this is, Greg is the mastermind behind Psalm Geo, longtime Psalm at the legendary Landmark Jimmy's, uh, which is no longer, but uh, Greg uh, made his mark there and uh, started this wonderful Psalm Geo, Geo program, which is a wonderful resource for all of us and is actually going to be our, our roadmap for the day. So Greg, why don't you give us a, an overview of where we're going today? Perfect, well, thank you so much, Lars. Uh, it's great to be here. This was a really, uh, really fun tour to work on uh, because it really is iconic grapes and of these distinct regions um, and really grapes that uh, you don't, you know, specialize in these certain areas. And um, Psalm Geo, it's what you see today is part of a larger platform uh, that covers in-depth wine theory, uh, tours that cover all the world's notable wine regions, and over uh, 100 really high resolution printable maps. Uh, but we're going to head uh, all around the world. So we're going to start off uh, in the east and we're going to head towards the west. Uh, we're going to have the Valpolicello of Masi. We're going to head over to Piedmont, Italy, Piemonte at the base of the Alps to, for Pio Cesare, and then up to the Loire Valley, uh, for Bouvet La, Bude, La, La Dube, and then uh, down to Uruguay, uh, Bodega Garcon, then up through Mexico, we actually have uh, uh, a little something different. We have an agave-based spirit to check out, Mezcal for La Luna, and then Klein Family Cellars in Sonoma County, some old vines in Fendel. Uh, but we're going to start in the Veneto in Italy, 
Um, here we are, really great proximity to Lake Garda. And really, when you're looking in the Veneto, you're looking for these uh, lower lying hills that line the Alps. Uh, you know, the plains aren't known for their wine culture, but these low lying hills are where all the best wine regions are. Um, and the Veneto is known around the world for a lot of different styles of wine, but uh, really, in particular, the wines of Balcolicello, and in particular, those, the wines of Amarone, are the most important, the most age worthy. Uh, here we have Corvina, um, Corvinone, similar but distinct uh, Rondinella and Molinara, the grapes uh, that are used to fashion that. Now we'll go down to Masi itself, and we'll actually head over as well to some of their vineyards. So Campo Fiorin, um, really beautiful countryside, beautiful vineyards. And here's the winery, and I'll hand it back to Lars to take it over for more. Awesome. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I love the landscape of Valpolicella, and uh, it's wonderful to have with us a producer that has such of such historic renown uh, and importance, Mazi. And here to present Mazi is Christina Sazama, who is wine educator for Santa Margarita USA, the importer of Mazi. Welcome, Christina, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. And so, um, yeah, the two wines we're going to talk about today are actually going to be combining the two styles that Greg just talked about, the fresh Val Policella and the distinctive Amarone. So let me share my screen. And uh, the two wines we're going to be talking about today are the, um, the Campo Fiorine and the, uh, the Costa, uh, I'm sorry, the Brolo Campo Fiorine. And so the history of the Mazi winery goes back to 1772 when the Boscaini family purchased their first vineyard in Valpolicella. And the, the winery is still in that same family today. They're well known, obviously, for their Amarone. Um, and they first introduced their Amarone back in the 1950s, which is not that long ago. But back then, there were only about eight producers of Amarone. So Mazi is certainly one of the heritage wineries of the region. And so the process that makes that Amarone is going to be important to the two wines we're going to talk about today. And that's the apostamento process, which is really the partial drying of grapes before fermentation. This is part of the terroir expression of the uh, region. But very quickly, let me talk about the grapes and then we'll get into the process and then the two wineries. And so the main grapes of the region, there is the Corvina. Uh, the Corvina is, brings that red cherry aroma and flavors to the glass. And then the Corvinone, despite si sounding similar, um, it's actually a distinct grape, though Italian law treats them the same way. So to the Corvina, Rondinella is added to the blend. And, and Rondinella here adds uh, color and adds structure, a bit of a, the tannic structure. And finally, there's an optional grape that used to be mandatory called Molinara. And um, it's an actually an important grape. Mazi still uses Molinara because while it doesn't give a lot of color, it brings a lot of freshness to the wines. It brings a lot of that acidity and lift. Um, so these are the three main um, uh, grapes of the region. And they can be made conventionally. That would be your fresh Valpolicella, just a, a nice, easy drinking red blend. Or they can, on the other end of the scale stylistically, is the Amarone, where all of the grapes are partially dried before fermentation. So um, the wines I'm talking about today are going to combine those two styles. So let me show you what I mean. And so here we go. And so the... Um, the, the Campo Fiorin here is going to take that freshness of the, um, of the Valpolicella and the partially dried grapes. So basically here, we've got in both cases, the Brollo and the Campo Fiorin, we have our fresh grapes come in and they go about their conventional fermentation, um, which, you know, uh, it, usually done in tank. But then part of the, the harvested grapes are going to be going off to the frutai to be partially dried. And after a couple of weeks of partial drying, those are going to be crushed and they will be added to the tank of the fresh Valpolicella, thus inducing a, a double fermentation, a second fermentation there. And um, here's one of the drying lofts. So you can imagine that this is a very labor intensive process. And so um, looking at that first wine we have today, we've got the Campo Fiorine, and this was first introduced in the 1960s, and it's part of Valpolicella's history because the Campo Fiorine here was the first Rapasso style of wine. And so Rapasso uses the lees of Amarone um, and then the pressed uh, skins and whatnot um, 
uh, of, of Amarone, that's added to the tank of Valpolicella. So Campofiorin here was the first Rapasso, but since the 1980s, they've been using the partially dried grapes, just as they do in the photo here, just as they do in Amarone. So Campofiorin here is 70% Corvina, 25% Rondinella, and 5% Molinara, again, for freshness and lift. But here, 25% of the grapes that um, go into the Campofiorin are partially dried. They're, they're dried for about six weeks, whereas for a typical Amarone, the drying process would go on for about three months or so. Um, and I do want to show you, here's a, a quick time-lapse video of the drying process, because in the glass of the Campo Fiorine, you're going to get both those like fresh red cherry as well as dried red cherry components. And you can see here, we're not not working with raisins or anything like that, um, but really the partial dried grapes of the region. And then I've got one more wine I want to talk about, which is the Brolo Campo Fiorine Oro. And so you can think of the Brolo as kind of like a Reserva version of the Campo Fiorine because it's made using that same double fermentation process as the flagship Campo Fiorine. But here, 30% of the grapes, so a touch more than the 25% in the Campo Fiorine. So 30% of the grapes are dried. And then the blend for the Brolo also introduces a, a grape that we've not talked about, and that's the Osaleta grape. And so the grape has a um, you know, long history in the Valpolicella area, but Osaleta was largely abandoned post phylloxera because the clusters and the berries of this ancient grape are really, really small, like crazy small. And so the grape was nearly extinct, but fortunately, Mixed viticulture is also a tradition of this area. And so in the late 1970s, uh, Sandro Boscaini, who's the current president and head of the family who owns Mazi, he found some Osoleta in a friend's vineyard and um, took cuttings, started to propagate the vine. And you can imagine with this, there's a high skin to juice ratio. So the addition of the Osoleta is gonna give a little bit more structure to the wine. So this is going to be 80% uh, Corvina, 10% Rondinella, and the final 10% coming from the ancient Osaleta grape. So really, these are both um, modern wines with an ancient heart, both showcasing the you know, indigenous grapes of the region and delivering the best of the two famous styles of the region, the, the fresh Valpolicella, and then we've got the integrity of Amarone by the use of those partially dried grapes, and they are delicious. Technical term right there. Indeed they are. Thank you, Christina. Well, well stated, well said. Uh, I always find it fascinating, the whole um, apacimento process and the fact that those particular grapes uh, lend themselves uniquely, more so than Cabernet or Merlot or any other uh, native grape, the, the, the native grapes that the, uh, Corvina, Corvinoni, lend themselves to this process so well and uh, um, it's almost magical. <laughs> so thank you very much. All right, so next up, we have another wonderful family. We really have this a tremendous panel. I'm so I'm pinching myself to um, just being in the presence of this panel of great producers. And next up, we have Cesare Benvenuto, who's a family proprietor of Pio Cesare Winery in Barolo. Uh, Cesare, thank you very much for joining us. Benvenuto, as uh, they say, Cesare. And uh, this is, I know, um, wasn't too long ago that we lost your uncle, Pio Bofa, and it wasn't it was just a few days ago was his birthday. So I think this is- uh, Yesterday, great, yesterday. Uh, yep, yesterday. So it's a great honor to have you on here uh, in his memory and in your whole family's honor. So Cesare, welcome. Thank you. Cesare, welcome is my name, full name, Cesare, <laughs> welcome. So <laughs> I would like to, first of all, to, to thank you very much for inviting Pio Cesare <laughs> at this very important, uh, tasting and in, in this very important with all these great uh, other producers so we are very honored thank you uh, let me introduce who, he, who we are so first of all i apologize for my english because i haven't had any nebbiolo yet today so i i am cesare benvenuto i represent the fifth generation of pio cesare pio cesare uh, was uh, founded in 1881 by cesare pio so Pio Cesare was uh, the name as he used to introduce himself because a long time ago in our region, they used to introduce themselves first, the family name, so Pio, and then Cesare first name. Cesare as myself. 
So we are totally obliged to be called, uh, to be named Cesare or Pio in our family. So Cesare, I'm going to interrupt you for one minute because I missed a cue and I wanted to ask Greg to give us an overview uh, on the on the Sam Geo of exactly where you are. So I'm going to ask Greg to just help us focus in and tell us exactly where you are, and then we'll let you get on with your presentation. Okay? No. Thank you. Sorry about that, Greg. For sure, I'll take it away. We are um, in Piemonte, uh, really here at the base of the Alps. Here we have um, over 40 DOC zones um, and 18 DOCG. Um, so really, really incredible area. Most of those really are centered in this um, area in the Lange, where some of the top wine regions are. And uh, specifically for Nebbiolo, it's the iconic gra uh, grape of the region. Um, and you know, when you're talking these uh, iconic grapes. Uh, it's really interesting because, you know, say, okay, maybe you can make an argument for uh, world-class, you know, for world-class Pinot Noir outside of Burgundy, which I think you definitely can. Um, with Nebbiolo though, I mean, you're really talking Northwestern Italy, um, Piemonte in specific, but this is uh, re really the top region for it. Um, here we are in Barolo specifically, um, Pio Cesare, uh, one of the few wineries that really has their, uh, their cellar still in the heart of Alba. And this wine, we're focusing on a couple top vineyards, uh, Moscone. This vineyard um, is really well represented by a lot of the, uh, a lot of the top producers. And also Ornato, um, as you can see on this perfect southwest flank, um, also between two other top vineyards. So there's definitely something special about that, uh, that hillside between Bricolino, Ornato, and Filetto. And here we are, great shot of the Moscone vineyard. And with that, I'll hand it right back over. Thank you. And again, Cesare, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting you. You were telling us about your family. No, no worry at all. So I apologize because the vineyards of our region are very difficult to pronounce. So, <laughs> but they are so old. Uh, names of the, that part of, uh, of Barolo region or Barbaresco in, in, in the case of Barbaresco that uh, are really representing uh, the history of our region. I was telling you that uh, Pio Cesare was uh, one of the very first ambassadors of Barolo in the world. We have in our office is a passport that was the number 55 of the Italian Republic. So it was the first, uh, one of the first to bring Barolo so we are talking about 140, 130 years ago, outside of Italy. So we have some uh, awards on, uh, and some diplomas in our tasting room dated uh, back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, uh, from tasting made in Paris, Brussels. So you can imagine how long was a trip to Brussels or to Paris by that time. So no, no planes no anything, so it was very diff difficult to travel, uh, more or less like now. <laughs> and, but it was very bright and uh, uh, smart to understand the importance to bring the Barolo name outside of Italy. And uh, step by step, we have been able to reach <laughs> the production of 400,000 bottles a year. So we like to call ourselves as an artisanal producers when Pio Cesare started to make wine uh, back to 140 years ago, so 1881, 2021, there were just four or five producers in our region. Now, not in Piemonte, but just uh, in Lange, so in the southern Piemonte, we are over than 620. So the competition <clears throat> is a little bit higher, but uh, uh, totally oriented to the great quality of Barolo. So, uh, uh, you have been able to show a beautiful map, and it is very important to understand the ge geograph geographic location of uh, of uh, of our of our region and on uh, and of our terroir because Nebbiolo and if I may also speak about Barbera have found the perfect location because uh, our region is uh, one hour driving to the Alps, so the highest mountains uh, Europe. And one hour driving south, we are on the, on, the, on, the, on the Mediterranean Sea. So two totally different microclimate conditions, which are allowing ourselves to grow uh, this unique grape variety. So Nebbiolo is a, uh, the first uh, uh, origin of Nebbiolo was uh, dated, dated back to 
the early 1800 and we are, uh, let's say, uh, making and evolving this gray variety uh, since almost two centuries. So Nebbiolo comes from an Italian word, which is uh, uh, Nebbia, fog. So, and the people of our region, um, they've called this gray variety Nebbiolo because this is the last grape in terms of ripeness and maturation during the harvest, which is usually late, uh, mid, late October. Long time ago, when uh, the temperature of the globe was uh, cooler, we used to also to have um, uh, uh, to harvest Nebbiolo in uh, early, mid November. So a lot of fog, which is also another uh, characteristic, very important for the unique touch of Nebbiolo because the humidity together with the, uh, the microclimate conditions, the soil, which is uh, uh, for more or less of the entire region, clay, limestone, and a just a little bit of sand, and makes this wine unique in, this, in, in, in our region. Uh, somebody has tried to make uh, Nebbiolo in other region, like uh, other parts of the world, making great wines, but totally different from our Nebbiolo in Barolo and in Barbaresco. So the production is very limited. And if I may <clears throat> tell you something also about uh, our vineyards, uh, in the presentation of the, if you can, can I ask you to re, 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 um, let's say um, review, review the, 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 the you mind bringing that um, back mind? Up? If is it for free, eh? <laughs> <laughs> we'll charge you later. Yes, uh, we have some beautiful pictures of our vineyard in Ornato and Mosconi, because uh, uh, we have the echo. So this is the vineyard Ornato. Uh, uh, Ornato Vineyard has been the first acquisition that my grandfather was able to acquire in the late 70s. Because uh, <clears throat> from the early 70s, we started to acquire vineyard because all the producers of our region have been able to uh, make wine from grape supplier until the 70s or the 80s. And step by step, we have been able to acquire vineyards located in different parts of the Barolo and the Barbaresco region, step by step. And from the 1972 until two years ago, uh, we have acquired different estates in 18 different sites in Barolo and Barbaresco, reaching the <coughs> total amount of vineyards of 75 hectares, which is quite uh, a good amount of uh, property, considering the fact that our region is uh, very small and with very limited uh, vineyards of uh, you know of a great quality. Ornato is one of those, and Ornato is contributing a part, contributing partially to make the Barolo, that is the wine of the day that we are featuring today in this uh, in this uh, uh, tasting. Uh, Ornato is one of the seven vineyards of our property, making our Barolo, let's say, that I will love to call it Pio, Barolo Pio, because uh, uh, we are totally oriented to make a Barolo or any kind of wine of our production, blending uh, vineyards of the same gray variety, divided in the different uh, villages of the Barolo. For example, our Barolo Classico and Barolo Pio is coming from five different villages inside the uh, area of Barolo. And this is the family recipe that uh, my great great grandfather started, started to make in 1881. And this is what we are really make, still making after so many years. And, after five generations. We are uh, totally convinced about that because we have uh, written in the last five vintages a sort of provocation under our label because this is not a single vineyard, but we have called it, please don't call it regular. As many uh, people from our business uh, uh, used to call our Barolo, Barolo regular, just because it was not uh, a single vineyard wine. So this is a Barolo with seven single vineyards in one uh, in one glass or in one bottle. 
which is totally reflecting the philosophy of Pio Cesare and the philosophy of uh, the history of Barolo and Barbaresco religion since uh, uh, the beginning of the last century. So, so this is a very important information that I would like to give you because uh, uh, this is the philosophy that uh, my grandfather have taught us through five generations. And this is what is the message that my uncle left us uh, to bring over for other, for other at least 140 years. Bravo. Great story. Thank you. So I have so many other things to say, but I believe my time is expiring. Uh, yeah. And um, I would like to say that uh, we are not depending on the vintage. We are trying to make our best year after year. So regardless of the vintage from Pio Cesare, you will, have, you will always have a very consistent quality. And I hope that you could agree with me next time that you will drink uh, a glass of uh, our wines. Well, I'm fortunate to be enjoying one and it's delicious. It's uh, fresh okay. and bright, gorgeous example of Barolo. Thank Especially you. 2017, that was an underrated vintage. Yeah. At the beginning, when uh, we immediately harvest, uh, harvested the, 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 the grape in uh, so four years ago. But now the quality and the great velvety elegance uh, character is uh, really coming up. And we are very proud of it. As you should be. Thank you very much, Cesare. I know you've got to go. You've got a meeting. But uh, if you have a moment, there was a question for you in the chat section. If you can answer that. For, can I uh, answer Andrew. by voice or by no, chatting? No, if you can write it in there, because we're unfortunately we're out okay. of time. But if you okay. can write it in there, that will be great. There's a couple Thank of Thank you again. Thank, Thank you again for this great opportunity. Grazie, Cesare. It's sempre I'm, going, I'm going to drink Barolo now. Please do. Have one for me. Ciao. <laughs> oh. Okay, Greg, I know we're, uh, we're staying in Europe, but we're leaving Italy. What's our next stop? We are headed up to the Loire Valley, uh, which is really the world's benchmark for a lot of grapes, uh, but specifically Chenin Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet Franc, and Melon de Bourgogne. Um, and keep in mind, you know, the Loire is a large area, right? You know, you can't really talk about it just as, just as one, you know, monolithic wine region. It's what, 400 almost 400 kilometers side by side to side. Um, so what, 250 or so miles. Um, and each area really specializes in um, different grapes and, and has different styles. Um, we're going specifically to Samor, um, where the focus really, uh, along with the, the still wines, uh, is also Cremant de Loire. Here we have Melon de Bourgogne focused on Muscadet, Sauvignères also for Chen and Blanc. Um, and then we head up more towards uh, Sauvignon Blancville. Um, but some more is really the center production for Cremant de Loire. Um, here we have Bouvet, La Dube. Um, Cremant de Loire, you're thinking, really focuses a lot on Chenin, but Chardonnay is also just so well suited to uh, sparkling wine production that it plays an important role as well. And um, you know, Cremant de Loire, we're talking, this is the, uh, the second highest production of any sparkling wine region in France, just right after Champagne. Um, so really incredible wines that always have uh, great freshness to them. And I'm, I'm a big fan. As am I. And we're very fortunate to have with us today Juliette Momosso, who is the CEO of Bouvet La, La Dubai. And Juliette, welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much for including Bouvet La Dubai in um, the... Uh, presentation tonight and uh, we are also a family winery and like uh, Cesare I'm also fifth uh, generation uh, running Bouvela du Bay and uh, let's take a trip on the Loire. Oh please. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are in Saumur. Let's land in front of the castle. We don't need more maps because Greg has uh, landed us in Loire. Here is the castle of, uh, of Saumur. It really expresses well how the, the Loire Valley functions because you can see this hill of limestone, the castle of Saumur on top of it, and this white stone, which has been excavated uh, from underground galleries from this hill of, of limestone. And the vineyards grow over this, um, this hill. 
and another scenery from Loire, very common from just uh, down here from the, the winery. Uh, a, a picture or should I say a painting of the production of uh, uh, wine here in Saumur, which dates back uh, probably to the 8th uh, century. This uh, painting is more recent, it's from the 16th century and it's uh, harvesting uh, in front of the castle of Saumur, but we can see it's red grape, it's not uh, Chenin, though Chenin dates back definitely from um, uh, 11th century. Um, and talking about Bouvilla du Bay, our winery was founded in 1851 by that man, Etienne Bouvet and his wife, Celestine Ladubé. Um, uh, it has a very long uh, history, 170 years uh, uh, this year in 2021. And uh, it's a winery that has been producing sparkling wine. Uh, mostly, we also have a range of steel wine, but mostly, mostly what we love to do is sparkling wine. Um, and my family, family Momuso, we are running uh, this uh, house since um, 1932. And you can see my father here, Patrice, uh, who has been running Bouvela du Bay since the early 70s, and I uh, took over now, but he's still with us. And this morning we just tasted the wine of, um, of 2021 and we did our first blending of Cremant de Loire this very morning. Uh, just another map, just to show you the length of the Cremant de Loire uh, area. And another appellation I want to talk about as well is Saumur Brut, uh, which is more, which is located south of Saumur. And uh, Crémont de Loire is a more recent appellation since uh, 1975, uh, like Crémont de Bourgogne and Crémont d'Alsace in France, and Saumur since 1957. You've seen the cellars. This, uh, this is some vineyard. And talking about this Chenin Blanc uh, grape, um, uh, Loire is, ver is the cradle for, for Chenin Blanc. Of course, it's mostly cultivated in, in South Africa, and we love South African Chenin Blanc. Uh, in France, it's mostly cultivated in, in Loire, 10,000 uh, hectares. Uh, it's the fourth most cultivated uh, grape in France. And Greg has um, explained us the, the variety we have in Loire. It's, 32 appellations using this particular grape in Loire, from sparkling, like Crémont de Loire we are talking about uh, today, but also to late harvest Chenin. Um, and I can mention some appellations like uh, Savenière or Vouvray in Touraine, or late harvest Chenin like Coteau du Léon or Car Car de Chaume. Probably the adjective that describes the most well uh, Chenin that is always mentioned is, is, is versatile. <laughs> uh, it adapts, I've tasted Chenin Blanc from India, it adapts uh, to uh, any climate, but mostly it likes cold and mild climate, which is what we have in, in Loire. Um, it, it buds uh, very early, but then it has a very long cycle, which is why it enables uh, uh, sometimes some late harvest Chenin. And it's particular, it, you see it's relatively small uh, berries. And uh, its particularity is that it has this great acidity, which leads to, to making great sparkling wine. Uh, in the Crémant de Loire Excellence um, uh, showcase today, it's uh, a great portion of Chenin Blanc, 80% of Chenin Blanc. And at Bouvilla du Bay, we always associate uh, Chardonnay. Chardonnay uh, is only cultivated in Loire to be blended, uh, uh, to be a blending grape. Um, and we also do at Bouvet 100% Chardonnay, but it's a very small uh, cuvee. But we love Blanc de Blanc style, Chenin Blanc and, and Chardonnay. Um, and the, the, the Crémant de Loire you're tasting, or you, which is mentioned today, 
has a minimum of 18 months on the, on the lease, which is uh, the, the time we take. Um, the, the production of Chemin Blanc et Loire is close to 500 hectoliters for all these, uh, these uh, 32 appellations. Um, but 60% of that whole portion is, uh, is used to make sparkling wine. Uh, so Crémant de Loire or, or Saumur Brut. Um, also, I, I would like to mention something about climate change. Uh, when I joined here the winery, my father told me that when himself he was fetching a base wine at our wine growers, uh, so that's uh, 50 years back, the wine had the potential of um, uh, nine, it was must, and it has had a potential of nine degree of alcohol. Uh, today, uh, the must we harvested in 2021 uh, is more towards 11.5 or 12 percent. So that tells a lot about uh, what climate change uh, has done. And in, in Loire, it's still um, a very good place for, for that Chemin Blanc to, to grow. Also coming back to Crémont de Loire Appellation, uh, this year we will reach in production all together with all the sparkling wine houses and all the producer, 23 million uh, bottles of, of Crémont de Loire. And it's about 130 hectares more uh, almost every year. So it's, it's uh, growing, it's really the future for, for Loire. Well, the Cremant is delicious, Juliet. It is round and beautiful fruit flavor to it. Very nice. Very, very nice. Great wine for the holidays as well. So thank, thank, thank you. you very much, Juliet. Thank you. And uh, I'm also going to ask you to take a look under Q&A. There was a question in there from Aga. If you don't mind writing a response to that, that would be wonderful. And as soon as you're... Uh... Yes, stop. Excellent. Uh -huh. That's good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Greg is going to take us out of the old world and into the new. Where are we going, Greg? We are going to cross the Atlantic. We are headed to Uruguay. Um, here we have, this is uh, one of the only wine growing regions in South America that really has an Atlantic maritime climate. Um, here we have the Rio de la Plata. Uh, this is the widest and largest estuary in the whole world and Montevideo, the capital of the country and also its largest city. Um, and these are the, you know, the, really the primary wine regions for the country. Um, all are heavily influenced by the Atlantic. Um, and you end up with these warm days and cool nights uh, and also plenty of sun, results in slow ripening grapes. Um, and it's really a fascinating area. Every year I taste the wines and they're, they're really just stellar, um, not, not as, found as often as you see some other regions, but they're really worth seeking out. Uh, Tanats become kind of the, uh, the classic grape of the region. And I would, I would say that uh, Uruguay is definitely the, one of the top regions in the world for it and really sees a lot of success. Uh, Maldonado, uh, seeing success with Tanat, um, but also uh, international varieties grow really, really nicely. Here we have Bodega Garzon, um, a truly impressive estate. This is, this is really a marvel. Um, and I've had these wines, they're just stunning, I'm a huge fan. And so with that, I'm excited to see more. Great, and I'm a huge fan of Christian Wiley, who was the general manager of Bodega Garzon, always gives us wonderful presentations, not to put any pressure on you, Christian, but welcome. Hey, thank you very much. Salud, Greg, appreciate the introduction. Lars, uh, super happy to be back on the show, on the program. Um, very, very humbled by, by the other guests, uh, the other presenters. Uh, my friend Cesare is, is outstanding wines from Marolo and Massi as, as well as the Loire Valley. I, I just hope to go to one of those castles soon. All right, I don't have much time, but uh, first of all, let me tell you, uh, there's not much history here. This is a 21st century terroir. It means that it was discovered or experimented on as of 2008 was actually the first uh, vines planted. And let me share with you a, a little PowerPoint that we put together. 
because uh, an image speaks more than a thousand words, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Am I sharing or not just yet? Not yet. Not yet. Coming, coming. Okay. Sorry about that. Now, here we go. Okay, so welcome to, to Bodega Garzón. Greg showed you where we are. I'd just like to highlight that we are only 10, 10 miles from the ocean, uh, due south to the Atlantic Ocean. Very cool climate, straight lines to Antarctica, really. And it's very important because of the cool climate as well as for the wind that provides very, very good breezes normally every day. So good, you know, good growing conditions. We are on latitude 30, um, 34.5 south, which equates to the premium uh, wine belt of the Southern Hemisphere, same latitude as Apalta in Chile or the Barossa Valley in Australia. Bodega Garzón is uh, a vision and long-term commitment of, of Mr. Bulgeroni. Don Alejandro and his wife Bettina has been, have been investing here in Garzón for the last uh, 20 years. What you see on the horizon is actually the, the, the ocean. There's a very famous summer resort called Jose Ignacio, which is basically like South America's Saint Tropez. So you have great cuisine, great beaches, beautiful people under the radar. It's just fantastic. Uh, uh, add on to this spectacular appellation. In Garzón, we grow a lot of different uh, olive trees as well. We make spectacular extra virgin olive oil. And, and the wine is, is a result of the vision and the consultancy of Alberto Antonini, who was given the task to scout the area and start this project. Basically, what you're going to see is it's an experiment. And uh, we have here, hang on, it's not changing the, the slide for some reason. There you go. We have more than 1,500 little plots. And that's very important because in one estate, we have a lot of different microclimates and that allows us to grow, as Greg was saying, other international varieties like Alvarino or Sauvignon Blanc on the slopes facing the ocean, where the slopes facing the north, looking at the winery, we have a lot of great, great, uh, red grape varieties. Tanat being the largest, this is like a CAT scan of our vineyard manager who is borderline genius crazy and planted all this estate. Here we have more rainfall than Bordeaux, but we actually have to irrigate because of because of the of the of the wind that dries the vineyards very quickly, but also because of the soil underground. It's uh, the oldest granite in the planet. It's the mother rock that broke in Pangaea, so we have this uh, meteorized granite that it's basically like a sponge. We have excellent drainage percolation, so we have to uh, dry. Uh, we can't dry farm, we have to actually irrigate, drip irrigate. So this is where I am now. It's the, it's a fermentation uh, cellar. They are tulips, they're concrete. There's no epoxy inside. And uh, this is where we ferment the, the tanats from the wine that we're having today. We're enjoying, I am at least just before lunch, a tanat single vineyard. Um, so just to, just to share with you how we make this wine, it's 100% Tanat is the grape from Southwest Madiran, made it to Uruguay, it's become Uruguay's flagship. Here on the coast of, of Maldonado in Garzón, we actually ripen very nicely. Tanat has a lot of seeds. You gotta be careful when you pick once the seeds are lignified. It's hand-picked. We ferment in those concrete eggs without uh, adding yeast, so it's just natural. Garzón yeast, domestic local yeast. And then we age the wine in uh, big bottis, big, big barrels of French Allier forest, but untoasted. We don't, we want to express the place. We don't want you to taste vanilla, whiskey, lactona, or any notes that are not part of, of our place of, of Garzón. This is a tanat of around 14, 14 and a half percent alcohol, but very, very balanced, very fruity, smooth, with a nice natural acidity, thanks to all the rain we get here, and a wine that is doing very, very well all over the world, especially in the US, where it would, it would retail around $30. 
it is widely available in, in you know, wine.com or the Bounty Hunter, but in a lot of restaurants, this is the wine that we, where we want to position the brand through, through the Somme's around the world. Um, I believe that would be, and I'm trying to stop sharing. Um, that would be my close to six or seven minutes of fame. I want to thank you so much for helping us you know, get the word out about Uruguay and Garzón and of course, Tanat, the healthiest grape out there, 2.4 times more resveratrol than a cab. So, you know, long life for those who drink Tanat. Amen to that. Very well said, very well done. Thank you, Christian, always a pleasure. The wine is beautiful. It's got beautiful balance and elegance. Uh, it's just very well done. I know Tanat sometimes has a reputation of being a tannic monster, but this is just gorgeously balanced. And, and because you, because of all the Psalms, Uruguay is the is the highest per capita consumption of beef, and our production of grass fed beef is absolutely spectacular with Tanat. You know the tight gra the tight tannins, the grain cuts through the fat. Beautiful pairing. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Christian, and and thanks for joining us on the tulip farm there. <laughs> all right, Greg, what's our next stop in the new world? We are headed to uh, Mexico, actually, to uh, check out Mezcal. Um, so here we have, when you when you look at these, these are a lot of the regions that you can of Mexico that you can make mezcal in. Uh, Jalisco, just right here. This is the center for tequila production. Um, the here is coming from Michoacan, uh, which is also one of the areas you can make tequila. Um, but Mexico has a history of producing agave-based spirits going back uh, at least 500 years, uh, definitely by the time of the Spanish arrival. Um, but there's some ed evidence that it, it could even be before that. Uh, it's been used in textiles, food, fermented into ricea, uh, many other uses throughout the years. The agave plant itself takes about five or six years, up to 25 to mature. Uh, a lot of that depends on the variety itself. And different kinds of agave are, are really similar to different grapes. Um, and you taste, you taste the different varieties and they can be completely worlds apart. Uh, here we are, this is the Cotija Mountains. Um, a couple different types around here that you see that you don't often see in Oaxaca like Bruto and Cupriata. Um, and you can also make, I should mention, um, mezcal out of blue agave, uh, same used in tequila production. And here we are, just a small distillery, really artisanal. Um, and I will say I've, I've been fortunate enough to go down to, uh, it was Oaxaca, unfortunately, not Michoacan, uh, several times to visit mezcal producers. And I gotta say, there's, there's really nothing in the world like an artisanal mezcal uh, distillery. It's completely different than anything you'll see in uh, scotch production or vodka or bourbon or, or really anything else. Uh, a lot of those distilleries are kind of run with one computer and you know four people. This is, this is really everything's done um, from scratch. And uh, I'd love to hear more about these stills too, uh, what, types of, what types of materials and uh, really, really fascinating uh, beverage. All right. Well, here to tell us more about that, those fantastic stills and this very different production is Salvador Picasso Chavez of La Luna Mezcal. Salvador, welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys very much for having me, uh, for having La Luna. I think this is a, a great opportunity, obviously, complete twist to what we've been hearing. And for me, very fascinating because I'm an avid wine drinker as well. Um, so it, it, it's uh, pretty amazing. I'm going to get to sharing my screen and telling you guys a little bit about why we wanted to speak to to the, the wine connoisseur, the wine uh, aficionado. I think there's a lot of um, parallels in terms of uh, what mezcal is, uh, especially artisanal, traditional mezcal, and what uh, a great, in, in the great wine category. So um, let me share my screen real quick and get to speaking to that. Um, so the idea here, and obviously the word, the keyword that's always used in the concept of um, wine is terroir. And with uh, Mezcal, we felt that that conversation was very relevant. We've dedicated our, um, I, for lack of a better term, marketing to trying to build those parallels for people. This shot actually that you see here is actually in a vineyard in Querétaro, um, Mexico. So um, pretty close drive for us in Michoacán. We went there with the intention of recording a video within vineyards, demonstrating 
the similarities between what wine is and what mezcal is, what uh, single varietal is, what ensembles or blends are, et cetera. So my plan is to do the same thing for you guys today. Um, we, you know, one of the biggest differences up front and Greg did a great job speaking to this um, and a great intro actually great to what, what I'm gonna speak to. Um, the first big difference is the raw material. Um, obviously in the, in the world of uh, wine, we're talking about grapes. In the world of mezcal, we're talking about agave. Agave is a, a very unique uh, species of raw material for us and for the world. Um, it is something that requires heat or cooking to break down its sugars to be simple sugars fermentable sugars. Um, and this is something that today in an industrial setting might be done in autoclaves or you know, even worse diffusers or potentially traditional brick ovens in the world of some traditional or uh, smaller batch tequilas. We use traditional methods for La Luna Mezcal. I always like telling people that we produce La Luna Mezcal in 2021 as it was been produced 500 years ago. It's the same exact uh, setting and um, intention. Um, this is uh, another vision of the setting. Greg's are, is, is much better. But uh, giving you reference to the fact that we're a coastal state. So a lot of times, um, the fact that we are a coastal state has some influence in our expressions. A lot of times people would reference that we have a lot of sal uh, salinity or uh, that kind of salty quality to what they're sipping on um, with our mezcal. Um, speaking to this area of the mountainous region of Cotija, that's where we're from. So my, my story and the story of La Luna is pretty uh, particular uh, because we're an immigrant family from Michoacan. Um, I went back there for this pursuit, um, ultimately um, in the producer seat now. Um, but I grew up in Sonoma, California. So this idea of, of terroir and wine was always around me and it continues to be. So um, in, in, in what we're doing today, I feel like we're in the best position to be able to continue to tell this story and allow uh, more people to more easily understand this category of mezcal because it's very complex. One of the first things I'd like to talk to is um, the fact that our distilleries in Michoacan are called vinatas, um, whereas in Oaxaca, for example, which is the dominant player in the whole world for mezcal production, or what people recognize, in Michoacan we call them vinatas, in Oaxaca they call them palenques. Vinata is kind of like the core to vino, and historically um, in this region we would call it vino de mezcal, but mezcal was not the reference of the plant, the 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 liquid itself. It was of the plant. So if you if you go to our part of Michoacan, um, in a neighboring state of Jalisco. A lot of people would reference, oh, yo tengo mezcal, yo tengo mezcal. And when they say that, they're not saying I have liquid. They're saying I have agave. So agave is synonymous with mezcal, mezcal synonymous with maguey. So those three words can mean the same exact thing um, if you just uh, switch them out. Mezcal, agave, maguey. So this concept of vino de mezcal meant it was a wine made of this plant. So this is the, the word wine um, has a historic um, a reference with us as well. Uh, this is kind of the setting of, of where I would um, start the journey of telling you, look how much there is uh, to talk about, even with just one producer. We produce about 20 expressions today of mezcal. Um, a lot of people usually only know one, right? So Blue Weber in the world of tequila is the most dominant, uh, dominant and most known agave. Um, we work with six different um, agaves in the state of Michoacan. There's a, a, over 100 in the whole Republic of Mexico that you could use to make Mezcal. Um, we have 20 expressions. A lot of them are ensambles, which are blends, but I'll get to why that's very particular and different in a little bit. Uh, these are the six that we work with here. Um, I, I, there's actually seven pictures, so I'm not that bad at math, but with six species, uh, just one of them is a, a completely wild one. Uh, another one is cultivated setting, but on the top left, you have Bruto. You can see it's a massive agave. Sometimes that takes up to 25 years to mature. Um, then right below it, uh, you have Cupleta, this guy right here, more bright green. Uh, this is also Cupleta, but we reference it as Chino, which is the local name, the colloquial name for this agave, but it's 100% wild, so we reference it a little bit differently. Um, but you could tell, even just by sight, these all look very different, and naturally, they're going to produce different uh, flavors and aromas in, in the way that we produce things. So uh, it, the excitement starts here with the, with the different raw materials. Um, the harvesting of it is really, obviously, what leads to the next phase of cooking, but the, the leaves or the pencas themselves um, are, are something that we obviously take off. Um, and then we get to the core where, where all of these sugars sit and live that we uh, ultimately want to cook out. And what you'll notice is this agave is white. But once we cook it and we extract all the sugars, um, it, it's going to look more brown, kind of like what's behind my shoulder here. This bagasso is actually shreds of the cooked agave. Um, this is how you cook it. So it's a literally traditional or conic earth oven. Underneath those pencas or the leaves, there's um, uh, volcanic rock or lava rock, 
right under that lava rock, there's wood. We like that wood for a fire. It heats up the rock. Um, we don't want any of the charring to actually happen with the agave. So we put the penca or the leaf as a protective layer because all you really want is a smoke um, over the course of five days to cook uh, the agave through. Um, a lot of times mezcal uh, is, is referenced as smoky. Um, well, the smoky quality comes from this. It's not just a, an accident and it's not something that's really added. Uh, traditionally, the, the smoky quality is here. And just like anything else, whether it's acidity or citrus notes or in the world of scotch peatiness, they all vary. Not every producer is going to have the same smoke levels or qualities to them. The wood choice that they have, the amount of time that they leave the agaves underneath, all those things are going to matter to the ultimate flavor profile and the ultimate smoke quality. I would say that um, universally, when I'm out there in the market uh, letting people try our product, they all note that our mezcal is much less smoky than what they're used to and other things that they have tried. Um, once we cook it, we shred it. Um, we shred it and then enter in these, uh, these tinas. Uh, they're made of wood. Um, and these tinas are going to be where the fermentation happens. This is 100% open air fermentation. We don't inoculate with any yeast. It's all wild yeast influence. Our fermentations can take as long as 10 to 12 days because of this slower process of how those sugars are combining with water to create our, uh, we call it tuba, um, the mosto in some areas, mash um, when you make beer. Um, so that, that, that is the activity that's gonna be happening here in these uh, dinas or tubs over the course of 10 days of fermentation. It's literally just water, uh, the, the shred of the agave and wild yeast in terms of what our recipe is for our creation. And we don't have a lot of control. Uh, I always tell people that the perfection of mezcal to some degree is imperfections. We, we try to control the least amount of things as possible. So we let kind of uh, open air take its course. Um, we do. The, we're, we are able to collect a little bit of, of the runoff of this agave when we're crushing it, um, and that we leave on the side. To, to it's, we call it the pie de levadura. So essentially, it's just a more concentrated sugar of the same juices. We let that um, uh, inoculate on its own. Obviously, you can tell there's a lot of activity there, and then we add about uh, 40 liters of this back to our tubs about day three of our fermentation. This is what um, basically the, the, the last stage of fermentation would look like for us. This is where the cap is sealed. There's no more oxygen, a lot more flavor creation going on for us these last three days as we see it. Um, but it's once again, it's kind of like a natural cap that's created with the actual bagasso and water itself. It's almost looks like mud, um, but that, that is um, the, the last stage of no oxygen for us. And lastly, the distillation, you were asking about what it is. We have a copper bowl on the bottom. We have a, a wood still, it's made of pine um, uh, as, as what, what goes on top of that. And then it's sealed with a copper cone. Um, and literally that's how we distill. Up until this point, it would taste a lot more like a beer, right? So right after it's done fermenting, it's gonna be much more like a beer, maybe three to 5% alcohol, uh, depending on how effective we were in our fermentation. Um, and then from there, we're gonna distill it once to achieve ordinario between 15, 20% alcohol and then distill it again for what we call refinada uh, to ultimately uh, land in your hands about 48% alcohol. Um, this is uh, the bagasso after the, or the shred, gabasso, bagasso, uh, both, both the same thing in the region in terms of what it is. It's a shred that ultimately we're taking out of the bowl um, that now becomes discarded. Um, but this is probably one of the most traditional, well, this is the most traditional way Michoacan has distilled in our area, in the Parapel. In the area of Cotija, we've done this with clay pot still, so even a little bit more robust and, and, and old school and maybe a little tougher to work with. Um, but that's all that, that La Luna encompasses. And as, as uh, you could see, there's a lot of different colors to our line, a lot of different aromas and flavors. But what we'd like to imagine is that if you guys sipped on this, you would take the approach of trying to find the same thing in La Luna Mezcal that you try to find in a great wine, right? You want to find a good nose to it. Uh, you want to take that in uh, and sip it. I um, mean, you're going to find a, a, an entry to your palate, a mid palate, and then a finish. I mean, it, it, some, some, some finishes are longer. A lot of times when you put them in a glass, you can find more leg or more viscosity to them. Um, so all of these all of these things, again, like when we speak to uh, mezcal, we like to speak to it the way that you guys would speak to wine and why I want to introduce it to, um, to this audience and to you guys as well. Um, and the hope is obviously that you guys could learn more with us um, in, in our journey and understanding more of the specifics, because this conversation could be much longer, uh, much more detail. Um, but I feel like it, this is kind of like a service level conversation to then entreat you guys to come learn more with us. Um, this is a little bit more of our line. As I mentioned, one of the things that we do a lot of is ensambles, which is like this red bottle here. You see it says ensambles. That is what's called a blend. In our world, the biggest difference is that we're not really doing a cold blend. So it's not cold juice being blended together. We literally are taking agaves, cooking them together, then it's co-fermentation, which I think is where a lot of the harmony and magic happens for us. 
because we've tried to replicate the flavor and aroma, if you will, with the single varietals of each, ultimately just doesn't happen. Um, it's unique to themselves and ultimately has uh, created a much diverse line and offering for the market. As mentioned, you know, 20 expressions is, is going, going pretty deep with it. Um, so I'll stop sharing and uh, leave it at that kind of, I would say kind of simple and kind of fast, but that is a world of uh, a traditional and artisanal mezcal from Michoacan and for La Luna specifically. I, I can't hear, sorry, Lars. Uh, I committed the ultimate Zoom sin, I'm sorry. <laughs> simple and fast, but fascinating and illuminating. Thank you very much, Salvador. So what fast, fair, very fast question, because you're over time. Yeah. What kind of glass, if you were going to, if a Sam was, and I know Sam's doing joy. Uh, yeah. Having a good mezcal after a wine tasting. What kind of glass should we be drinking in that? Um, so I, I if, if you're really trying to pursue the same thing you're doing with wine, obviously you could use a wine glass. It's it's, it's almost no different. I, I like veladoras. They're, they're a little bit shorter, a little wider. Yeah, you don't overwhelm your nose with it. Um, but uh, and you kind of with because it's spirits a little bit more volatile, I would say, obviously, higher alcohol. You want to keep it a little farther away from your nose. You don't have to really get it in there as much as you would with um, with wine. Get it a little farther away. Give it a little swirl if you need um, and, and start picking them up. So the glass where we use tr for us is veladoras. They're a little bit they're like this tall, a little round like that. Um, but a wine glass works well as well. Awesome. Thank you. I, Absolutely. I think some of us have those handy. So that'll work. Great. Great. Thank you very much, Salvador. And Greg, what's our last stop on this iconic tour of distinctive regions? All right, we are headed up to California, um, specifically the North Coast. Uh, here we have the, the Pacific Ocean. Obviously, this is uh, really when you're talking all of California. That's the, uh, that's the great moderating influence. It's the, uh, the air conditioner of all of the, uh, the really great wine regions of the area. Um, and specifically, we're headed to Sonoma. Uh, here we have the Bodega Bay and the Petaluma Gap uh, allows winds and oceanic influence to come through. We have Time Family Cellars. Um, and also we're going to check out, this is a kind of Contra Costa area um, near the Suisun Sun Bay. This is where uh, we're really fortunate. We have a lot of 100-year-plus old vines of uh, Zinfandel. Which California Zinfandel, you know, this is really the benchmark for the grape. This is uh, about, about as a American of, of, of a grape as you could get. You know, a lot of our others come as uh, imports from, from European uh, wine regions. Uh, but Zinfandel is kind of like the classic American grape, right? And a lot of these vines, they survived prohibition um, because they could handle being shipped across the country. Basically, you could get the, uh, you could get the little packets of must and, uh, you know, heaven forbid you'd ferment them into wine, but... Uh, Luckily for us, that's how we end up with all these um, 100 plus year old vines of Zinfandel, which are, are definitely a treasure. So I'm excited to hear more and hand it back to ours. Awesome, thank you very much, Greg. So we have Tom Gendel with Klein. Uh, he is the Director of Winemaking and Viticulture, and he's here to talk to us about his Klein fog swept Pinot Noir, as well as that whole area. I've been in, I've woken up in San Pablo Bay and just tried to figure out where I was. <laughs> so Tom, take it away. Yeah, thanks so much, Lars and Greg, and um, everybody for having me on today. I'll start sharing my screen because no one wants to look at me. Um, yeah, there, so um, yeah, Klein was established, um, you know, with, like uh, Greg mentioned, we've got vineyards, um, some hundred year old vineyards, but today we're talking about the Petaluma Gap, about um, Sonoma. It's the heart of Pinot Noir country in Northern California. Um, yeah, so Klein was established in 1982, so we're 40 years old, so, you know, um, that's a good amount of time time for a California winery, but comparative to some of our European friends, we're very, very short lived. Um, but we started investing in the Petaluma Gap in 1998 is when we started planting this vineyard. This is our catapult vineyard. And um, we're tasting our fog sweet Pinot Noir because of obviously the fog is the major, major factor out there. As you can see in this wonderful photo, this is a winter shot of our catapult ranch where most of this wine comes from. Um, you know, Klein's been certified to sustainable. Um, it's a, we're a big family winery, and we just basically want to do the best. We have our own method of organic farming, and um, sustainable sustainability is a big, big push in California and throughout the 
throughout the industry. I believe almost all of Sonoma's vineyards are certified sustainable now. And uh, we have our own organic method of farming as well. And uh, where we use things like compost, we use compost teas. Um, we try, we don't have, we've stopped using fungicides. Well, sorry, we've stopped using uh, pesticides and herbicides. Um, and we only use sulfur as a fungicide. So really, really hands off in the vineyard. Um, but that was a big change in the early 2000s, but it's really reaped its benefits. Um, this is our catapult ranch, which we were taking a photo. Um, so if you imagine the photo that we just saw, it was we were sitting up here overlooking our lake and our vineyards over here. Um, this is north, so the Pacific Ocean is literally half, a, you know, half an hour drive from um, where this vineyard is. Um, these light purple colors, this is all uh, Pinot Noir, this is Chardonnay, and then this is Syrah. But because it's California, we've got other things. This is some Viognier down there, Sangiovese. There's a couple of rows of Nebbiolo hidden in here somewhere as well. And um, just a great plethora of varieties. A little Merlot and Malbec, but definitely, as you can see, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are the two kingpins here. Um, and the Petaluma Gap itself is about, seven, I think it's 75% um, Pinot Noir. So Pinot Noir is definitely a, the kind of main factor in the Petaluma Gap, um, which is a sub-region within the Sonoma Coast. Um, to compare, to compare to more famous neighbors like the Russian River, which is a little bit further north, we're picking up, um, easily a month later than a lot of the Russian River counterparts, and that's all to do with the proximity to the ocean, the wind, the wind um, t tunnel that's created, and um, the fog that comes along with it. Um, so yeah, this is a fog sweep Pinot Noir. I'll touch on it. Um, it's eighty-six percent catapult, fourteen percent of our other ranch called Diamond Pile, um, a mixture of cl uh, clones. The Pinot Gap is really interesting. Well, it's I guess the whole North Coast region is pretty interesting. Um, so the Sonoma Mountains. There's a bunch of Sonoma Mountains. Um, you've got uh, you've got Wildcat and Sonoma Mountain, which kind of are the first mountains there. Um, then you've also got the Mayacomas Range and Mount Vida, which is on the other side of the Sonoma Range, uh, of the east, eastern side of Sonoma. And then you even you've got the Napa Mountains, which is um, Oakville and um, those mountains. They're all basically from the same geological events. Um, they've all they're all actually called technically the Sonoma series soils. Um, they're heavy, heavy clays on top, um, but fairly shallow, and then they go into straight basically um, volcanic ash um, rhyolite being the main rock in there and so you've got these three mountain ranges and um, we're the furthest west so the closest proximity to the um, Pacific Ocean so we get lots of fog um, and lots of wind the Petaluma Gap is known um, it's the only AVA in the world that is distinguished by its wind pattern um, the winds on average are about 10 miles per hour um, they're very they're reasonably strong and um, you've got low-lying hills out at Bodega Bay which is just north of San Francisco um, these low-lying hills, which um, basically it's to the south of the Russian River, and then further to the south you've got Mount Tam, which um, basically leads you into the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, those two, uh, basically you've got this low saddle, and the wind comes through there, hits into the Sonoma Mountain, and then gets funneled down into the San Francisco Bay. Um, yeah, and so really, really interesting region. These are just our beautiful sheep that we keep to use our vines down. Uh, to keep our weeds down, we use sheep and goats throughout the season. Um, like I said, we've stopped using herbicides as well. Um, what else can I cut? Yeah, this is this is the growing season, and um, you're looking north here. That's Sonoma. We're sitting on the western edge of Wildcat Mountain, looking north towards Sonoma Mountain, and you can just see that fog streaming in. This is the middle of the growing season. This is still, you know, kind of mid morningish. This would be around about ten o'clock in the morning, um, and you can just see that strong, strong wind pattern. Um, we're right in the middle of the Petaluma Gap, um, kind of basically we're uh, just to the south of Stagecoach Road. Um, famous neighbours, we've got uh, to the north, Gap's Crowns in the northern end of the Petaluma Gap. Um, right uh, on the other side of the fog, just you can see a little bit of greenness amongst the oak trees there, that's Rogers Creek, um, Keller's close neighbour as well as Griffin's Lear. Um, all famous places known for producing amazing Pinot Noir and also a little bit of Syrah as well from some of these fantastic vineyards. Um, but yeah, you're um, pick, typically picking the last couple of years have been warmer. Um, 2019 was probably the closest to a mild year we've had in a while. and uh, But we're still picking in October, you know, kind of talk, pick, picking second, third week of October. Um, perfect ripeness. Um, I love these wines, because the Petaluma Gap, because we've got that extra long hang time. The hang time really helps develop a lot of the fruit flavor. So you get amazing, um, you get amazing ripe ber berry fruits, but with the extra long hang time, with the fog and the wind, you're getting thicker skins, you're getting smaller berries. 
um, and you're getting more ca uh, development of flavor. So you get all this wonderful um, earthy ca characteristics. I get a lot of uh, forest floor and mushroom in the wines. Um, you get all the detail that Pinot, that great Pinot Noir can have um, versus just kind of overt fruit. So you've got the best of both worlds. The acidity hangs in there really nicely as well. And so, you know, even though we're picking in October, you're still picking at 23 and a half to 24 and a half bricks, making these gorgeous, delicious, smooth fruited wines. Um, you know, and then obviously a lot of open top fermenting um, for these wines, um, usually around about two weeks on skins. Um, we then go into uh, French oak, um, mostly medium long, medium plus toasts, just to add some of those spice qualities back to it as well, but not being over the top at all. I think this wine's around about 40% new, new French oak. Um, definitely the fruit ha can handle it. Um, typically uh, crops at the at the Catapult Ranch, this is overlooking a couple of my favorite blocks. We've got uh, B3 and B4 um, here, and then also C1. Um, We've got beautiful, nice red fruits and um, yeah, just really delicious, eat, smooth drinking wines. Um, just uh, with us being or, uh, organic, our own form of organic farming and um, being sustainable, we have a lot of biodiversity as well. I love the hawks and I just love being out in the vineyards and uh, seeing just, you know, how happy and healthy everything is out there. And just, it's so much fun growing Pinot Noir. It's so many different expressions. This Fog Swept is a, um, a new product for us. Um, you know, like I said, the clients invested in Pinot Noir in 1998 and it's really paying, starting to pay, pay dividends 20 years later when these vines are at full maturity and producing astounding astounding fruit yeah and once again that's um looking to mount tam over the foggy landscape you know this is early-ish morning 809 and you can just see how that fog billows through there we look overlooking the sarar and pinot blocks out there can't even see the pond or the lake no i think that covers it thanks and um we'd love to see you all out in sonoma sometime soon where we can do that again and um have everybody have everybody for a visit I would love that. Like I said, I've woken up in that fog and it's uh, quite dramatic. Um, but thank you, Tom. That was uh, awesome. We appreciate it. I think um, I don't get to hear people say it's fun making. I don't get to hear winemakers say it's <laughs> fun making Pinot Noir very often. Usually they blame their gray hair or lack of hair <laughs> on Pinot Noir. But it definitely, um, you, it doesn't really, uh, it's not very nice for, for screwing up. It really shows any flaws or any mistakes you make out in there. So, um, but, you know, working with great grapes and having a great team in the winery, um, you can have a lot of fun making Pinot. Yeah, it's my favorite wine to drink. So, yeah, cheers. Excellent. Well, I'm glad you're one with the variety. The wine is delicious. So, thank you. It's beautiful, brown fruit. It's absolutely gorgeous. So, thank you, Tom. And thank you to each of our brilliant panelists for this wonderful educational opportunity. There was some good feedback in, uh, in the chat as well as the Q&A section if you get a chance to catch up on that. Uh, I want to remind everybody to get your essays in. Lynn, you want to give us a fast reminder about the deadlines that everybody's facing for that? Yes, thank you, Lars. Uh, so we'll be sending out an email to all of you uh, by Thursday night. If you don't receive it, you're welcome to email me at info at somfoundation.com. Uh, also check your spam filter, but you'll receive the prompt by then. Uh, you'll need to submit your essay to us by uh, midnight on December 22nd, and we'll have the um, winners announced by the 30th of December. And just let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Lars. Awesome. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you, Greg, for driving the virtual bus around uh, around the world for us. It was awesome. Love the program. Uh, and so just a reminder to everybody that this is was has been recorded on Facebook Live on the Psalm Journal platform. Um, you're going to be able to find the recording on psalmjournal.com as well as psalmfoundation.com. And the printed recap will be printed in the February-March issue of the Psalm Journal. So once again, thank you all on behalf of the Psalm Journal. Psalm Foundation. And uh, please join us January 20th when we take a look at a cross section of Western Europe. That's our next webinar, our first of the year. This was the last of the year. So wishing everybody happy holidays and a wonderful new year. Thank you again. Ciao. Cheers. Gracias. Salud. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>